Amen. Uh, I believe that uh, even in Gary's death, uh, life came out of it. Uh, living hearts were touched, lives were changed. Uh, we're going to begin this, John. You can start that recording. Today is August 28th. It is 2011. Our message is called Night Comes. So you might write that in the notes section of your bulletin. Anybody in here uh, watched any TV in the 80s? <laughs> oh, right. It's funny how what was cool in yesteryear is laughable today. So y'all enjoy this next clip with us. Knight Rider, a shadowy flight into the dangerous world of a man who does not exist. Michael Knight, a young loner on a crusade to champion the cause of the innocent, the helpless, the powerless, in a world of criminals who operate above the law. These are people who drive around in cars and save the world. And uh, this this came in in the 80s as Dukes of Hazard went out. And I, I suppose today it's something more like Fast and Furious. Yeah. But listen, in this uh, video, the narrator says, A young loner is on a crusade to champion the cause of the innocent and the powerless in a world of criminals who operate apart from the law. It's an amazing thing that uh, a whole TV show could be based on that kind of concept. And what is he armed with to fight the powers of, of wickedness that are oppressing the world? A car that talks and drives fast. Uh, as ridiculous as some of that is, I, I think some of you can admit that was cool back in the day, yeah? Yes. Look, I remember people putting the little things in their cars that went back and forth. Uh, that's back before Pontiac Fierros blew up. <laughs> I, wanna, I want you to turn with me to Psalm 37. I promise this will come full circle. Uh, if you are new to the way that we do things, we are too. Every week we do it differently. If you don't like it this week, try us one more time and see what you think next week. There. Amen. There. So Bill's there. Are the rest of us getting there? There. The sermon title was Night Comes. In the Jewish history, in Jewish writing, in Jewish thought, uh, days do not begin with the sunrise. Uh, that is a very Roman, very Western concept. Uh, the staple of Jewish society is the Sabbath. The Sabbath begins with the lighting of a candle at sundown on Friday evening. That begins the Sabbath. It starts at night with a flickering light, just a soul flickering light that is announcing the sun is going to rise. Prepare for it. Get ready for it. This is how the book of Genesis starts. The book of Genesis begins in darkness and moves to day. This is commentary on the way that we're to view the world. Our lives begin in darkness and they move towards the light. But the reality is, is that this is a cycle. And as much as we may have started in darkness and many of you are walking in light now, Darkness is coming again when no man can work. This gives us a timetable. In athletic events, there's a clock, right? I mean, it's usually divided into quarters or halves, and you have some idea how much time is there. In the course of human events, this is not the case. There is no clock. There is only the anticipation that we all have a very, very similar destiny. What is completely within your control is what you do with the time that you're given. 
And I want to tell you, friends, Americans do whatever they want to do. We can sometimes stay home from church because we're tired, but if we want to go to a movie, we have no problem doing it. We can decide that we cannot keep our kids out on Wednesday night because they have school the next day, but stay at a baseball game until after midnight with no problem. We do exactly what we want to do. I want to tell you there are only so many hours of life in which a man can work. There's a finite time that we have to work with, and it's an important time period. Are y'all in Psalm 37? Yeah. 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 Here are some exhortations that come from this psalm. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. This is a judgment upon the entire world. The entire world stands condemned already and our God is rescuing a remnant out of that world. Mankind is not basically good and then becomes corrupted. Mankind is corrupted and has a shot to escape a fatal disease called sin. We have a shot at that. One man sinned and death has reigned over all mankind. The fate of those who sin, the wages of sin, is death. And there's nobody that is exempt from that. Death is reigning upon mankind. Listen to what this next verse says, though. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastures. Trusting in the Lord. In Hebrew, this is batah. It means to have confidence, to feel a sense of safety or security. Where should our safety and our security, our confidence come from? From the Lord. This gives us an opportunity to whatever land we're in to call it a good land. To feel a sense of security because while death is certainly coming, you are living the fullness of life. The fullness of life can be defined quite simply as living within God's will. Not a set of church rules. Not a set of church doctrines. Within God's will for your life. God's will for Darren's life might be that he turn right at the next stop sign. He has an appointment for him there. That does not make that God's will for Matthew's life. And what we're looking for most of the time as American Christians is a cheat sheet. A set of cliff notes that says, look, when I get to these kind of stop signs, which way should I turn? It is a whole lot easier to have a list of rules than it is to cultivate a relationship where you're expected to hear from God and He speaks. But friends, this is what the kingdom was founded upon. That a man could hear from God. When Jesus blessed Peter and said, you are a rock on which I'll build the church, He was not speaking of Peter the man, but the revelation Peter had just gotten from the heavens. That a man could hear from God understand who was speaking with him and then obey his word. As many as are led by the, the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. This is how we know the difference between wheat and chaff, sheep and goats. Are we being led by His Spirit? Psalm 37 encourages us to show confidence or trust, security, safety in the Lord. And the result of that is that we enjoy safe pasture. Verse 4. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. This is a, a funny Hebrew verb. It, it's not speaking of somebody's wife. It's a nag. And a nag, a nag means happily, softly, pliably. When the Bible says to delight yourself in the Lord, in the Hebrew mind, this is like silly putty. It's something that the Lord is easily moldable. It's soft. When we're before the Lord, are we telling Him what we want? Are we telling Him how our lives should be and what should happen? Or are we pliable in His presence saying, Lord, I love You. You desire for me what is best. So I'm asking you, what should I do? Yeah, These are important questions. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you... What's that say, church? Desires. He'll give you the desires of your heart because it will be Him who formed them, conceived them, and birthed them inside of you. But make no mistake, the Lord is not your genie. He does not give you the desires of your heart when the desires of your heart are wicked. He does not work at your command. You work at His command. So we show trust in Him, confidence, safety, security, and then we come into His presence 
and we are pliable, soft, workable. Lord, what is it that you want of me? The third one that I wanted to show you before we move on is commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noon day sun. Commit in Hebrew is galal. And have you ever pushed something that was heavy and once you got it rolling, you didn't know if you could stop it? Maybe you removed a, a chalk from wheels while something was on a trailer or a driveway. Where's Brandon? <laughs> Cody was there. Yeah, you remove this and you take a little effort to get it going, but then you can't stop it again because of the laws of inertia and momentum. If you don't understand those, ride with me in my truck sometime and I will show you exactly how that works. This word that is galal in Hebrew, uh, commit in your English Bible, means to trust or entrust and roll with. You galal away a stone. When If a Hebrew were speaking of a stone being rolled away from a grave, you would galal. It means to put enough force into it that you're rolling in its direction and nothing stops you. It speaks of gaining momentum. When we commit our ways to the Lord, it means we're rolling in the direction that we just got from Him while we were pliable. And then this begins to describe a walk with God that looks a little different than ascending to a creed, doesn't it? There is another way. Anybody in here reading a Bible that is not NIV today, raise your hand. God bless you. And, and Cody, you you got a, a nasty, right? Read the 23rd verse in the nasty. Read it loud so people online will hear us. The steps of a man are established by the Lord. He delights in his way. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. King James says, by the Lord, uh, the steps of a good man are ordered, and his way he is pleased in. This is one where NIV probably didn't get it right, but I want you to hear this. God had an intended footstep for you. He intended for there to be an order, a pathway, an established path for you to walk in. One of the difficulties in, in translating this verse in Hebrew, honestly, is that there's a pronoun in it. And it says, uh, he delights in his way. And we don't know what the antecedent of the pronoun is. So to put that another way, we don't know who is delighting in the way. Does that make sense? God has ordered your path. And then there's some question, is it God or is it the man that delights in the path? I think we could resolve that today by saying both. If the Lord has ordered your footsteps, how could you not love it? But what if you endure hardship? What if He wants something of you that is difficult? Any mamas in here got dreams for your babies? Yeah. Raise your hand if you got a dream for your baby. Anybody hope that your child is blind or homeless? Anybody in here hope that your child's martyred in a foreign country? Anybody in here hope your child is lame for 38 years? It's funny, we're not volunteering for those things, are we? How excited are you, though, when you hear somebody that was crippled for 38 years was healed? It's the stuff that the Bible is written of. When blind eyes are open. Anybody in here that did not raise our hands for martyrdom? I've been preaching about this for a month. This was the expectation of the church for more than 300 years. When you got born again, you expected to die soon because the world hated you and they killed the Messiah, so you knew they wanted to kill you. It's only in recent times that we begin to develop ridiculous 40-day plans to make you fat, rich, wealthy, happy, and an American Christian. Yeah. How about this? Do we really want what the Lord wants for our life, or do we only want it as long as it agrees with our general plan? Come on now, how many of you have ever thrown out a fleece to get exactly what you wanted? I one time drove past a car dealership. That white Silverado with leather bucket seats and the 350, if it was still there when I came back by, I would know that that's because the Lord wanted me to buy. It had been on the lot for 137 days, but if God didn't want me to have it, I mean, He would remove it. This is like jumping out of an airplane saying, if the Lord doesn't want me to hit the ground, I won't. This is putting the Lord to the test. But all of Christianity has fallen into the habit of declaring what we want and then trying to manipulate God into it. Friends, it does not work this way. 
Our goal is to become confident in whatever the Lord would do, find security in that, to then become pliable in His presence so that He can show us what He wants from us and then roll in the direction He's pushing us. And that orders our footsteps. It orders them in a way that both you and God can be pleased with. How many of you want the Lord to be pleased with you? Amen. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants what's best for you. And what is best for you might be that you're refined seven times over, just like His Word. Turn with me to John 9. Actually, turn with me to Ephesians 2. How about that? There. The girl's fast. There. I'm still trying to get there. Ephesians 2. This is a familiar verse, but I want to read it. Will y'all indulge me that today? Is that okay? Yes. Look, because we were going to read it even if you said no. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, let's start in verse 8. If you can quote this, that's okay. Stare at the page anyway. See if you can absorb it somehow. Okay? For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Before we move on to some argument that never existed in the first century regarding faith and works, isn't it pretty clear to the original audience that God saving you was an act of benevolent mercy? Yeah. Not something that you deserve. And what was He saving you from? Let's be clear. What was it? Death. Hell. Hell on earth and hell later. An empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, the Bible says. He saved us from that. If you snatch somebody who was homeless, jobless, friendless, penniless, maybe clothesless, <laughs> CJ just caught that, naked, all of those things, and you gave for them a life. If you put clothes on their back, food on their table, a job, a direction, a future, how well would you take it if they resented your advice? Hmm? Yeah, and that example doesn't begin to come close. He saved us as an act of benevolent mercy. So that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship. You know what he didn't say? Steph, he didn't say we are God's finished product, did he? Yeah, so we can all rejoice when you look to the left and the right, you can go, God's not quite through with this person yet, which means you can be patient with him, right? Anybody in here ever had a flooring project done? Really? I've done foreign projects for half of them. It doesn't look beautiful the moment you start. You usually have to tear out stuff. It never comes up as easy as you thought that it would. And then you have to lay some kind of foundation before the pretty stuff starts to grow. Right? Or starts to adhere to it. Our lives are the same way. The old yucky never comes up as fast as you would like. The project never completes as fast as you like. And the truth is it always costs a little more than you thought it was going to because you don't understand when you begin what's being asked of This is why it's an unending commitment. He asks for everything from the very start. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Watch this. You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. What? To do good works. What's the next phrase? which God prepared in advance for us to do. So this means, Mike, it means, Lynette, that God prepared in advance. My wife fixed chicken Alfredo the other night. They were so good. I woke up Saturday morning and asked her to fix it again. I made it for breakfast. <laughs> the preparation for that started at noon. The actual meal was served at 7.30. Yeah? There was preparation involved. Our God spent time preparing a life for you. This means that He envisioned, He can do this centuries in advance. He envisioned for you certain tasks and ordering of your path and the way that it should look. And He did this because you are His workmanship and He has that right. He did this because He desired that through you, the creature that He made, His work would get done. Don't we have some obligation then? Maybe even a great obligation? To find out what that is and walk in it? When you get right down to it, Hebrew words like repent that have come to us in English and been robbed of power literally mean turn from this non-ordered path that you're on. This path of your own choosing. Get 
right back on the highway that God has designed for you. There's no uniqueness left in our walk. Whatever we do is what everyone else is doing. Whatever we read is whatever is being sold at the bookstore as the latest fad. Where is the individual unique leading of the Holy Spirit today? Friends, He brought you here for a reason. He ordered your steps to bring you into the door. And it was not to put a warm butt in the seat. That really was not the case. The truth is, some weeks we don't have enough seats, other we have too many. I never worry about those things. He brought you here so that you would discover the path that He wants you to walk in. Looking for the next task. How many of you woke up today and said, Lord, what do you want me to do today? We tend to think in much broader perspective, much longer term, but you are not guaranteed tomorrow. So the only real question is, what are you going to do today? I was at a swimming pool yesterday and tears caught me by surprise for a minute. 45 days ago, at the very same swimming pool, my seven-year-old father was doing backflips off of the diving board. And today he's in the presence of God, and his body is buried in the earth. None of us knew that would happen. The question for you is today, what has the Lord told me to do? If you get so good at doing what he tells you to do today, then we'll venture to wonder about next week. But i got to be honest, I'm not seeing a lot of that. What we see mostly is that we do whatever we want to do and consult Him afterwards. The Bible says if we persist in going our own way, He will never be willing to forgive us. Did you know that? You could dismiss that as Old Testament if you want, but Old Testament is the only Bible that Paul carried. The Old Testament is the testament of the New Testament. <laughs> it is the Bible that they carried for 200 years before your newer testament was codified. It's quoted in every book of the New Testament. Every one. Surely it's authoritative. At what point did we take this seriously? Are we just happy? Go with the masses like lemmings off of a cliff. Are you quiet because you're thinking about it? God prepared something in advance for you to do. He did. My life's been obsessed with this. I know in general some directions He's told me to go. When I see people, sometimes I feel a unique connection. And I know that we're a part of each other's destiny. I know that. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Do you have experience though? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going forward for a book for Zeke this morning. I can't write about Zeke like he's gone. Because I don't believe he is. I'm just away for now. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I hope you can hear this. Yeah. Turn with me to Philippians. I want to show you something. Then we'll get more into the ninth principle. In the second chapter of Philippians. Friends, has anybody, don't raise your hands for this, but you think inwardly. This is one of those rhetorical, you don't need to answer out loud type questions. You've been to a counselor, know someone who's been to a counselor, family member's been to a counselor. Secular counseling, even if it's called Christian, is obsessed with something. Me, mom, mom, how that made me feel. It is always self-centered. Biblical counseling is never self-centered. These two things are absolutely in opposition to each other. Philippians 2 is going to teach us something. Your attitude has got to be like that of Christ Jesus. Nobody pays a counselor $200 an hour, $300 an hour, $400 an hour to tell them to be self-sacrificing. To let themselves decrease that Jesus might increase. They pay them to lie to them and tell them, if you indulge your flesh, if you get enough me time, you'll be happy. I want to tell you, I've been born again now for 18 years. I've been working in the ministry for 15 and been ordained for another 14 or so. I have never seen counseling outside of a church work out well, ever. Not, not one time. I've seen a 0% success rate. There, why would you be going through all of that? We have a hurting world that's looking for an answer. And when we present the answer, the Lord will either illuminate it and they'll see it as real, or they'll persist in going their own way. Listen to what Philippians 2 says. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion... 
Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Have you ever tried to be one with somebody? Any married people out there can say amen? Amen. Being one with someone does not work when you tell them, to make me happy, this is what you must do. Amen. This is how today is going to go. I'm going to get some me time today. Do you understand? <laughs> See, what needs to happen is everybody in here needs to revolve around me. What we're going to do today is whatever I want to do. Whatever makes me happy, fills me up inside, you know? Do you want to be one with anyone like that? There's not enough room for themselves in there. Much less you as well. Selfishness is the opposite of Christ. And the church, every church, is full of selfishness. Listen to this. Do, not, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Nothing. This means that there is no Christ-sanctioned activity that is there to build you and your desires. All of our desires were supposed to come from being pliable in the presence of the Lord, Him planting them in us, and then growing from there. None of our desires were supposed to come from self. So you could spend hours examining your childhood and why a leaf blew in the window, landed on your foot, and you've just never been the same. You broke an eyelash, and since that moment in your life, it's all been downhill. The Bible says selfish ambition is something we cannot be a part of. Or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. I have never met anyone who is a licensed counselor that truly taught that principle. Ever. Not in cancer centers. Not in hospice. Not anywhere have I ever met a counselor that truly taught that the goal of Christian living, the goal of life by definition, is to esteem others more than yourself. And friends, this is abundant living. Amen. Anybody in here ever bought a new car? Yeah. It feels good, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, you can smell it, can't you? <laughs> I mean, and when it's clean, it rides even better, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. How long does it stay that way? <laughs> Imagine that you <laughs> sacrificed and gave someone a new car. How long would that feeling stay with you? Long time. Probably a lifetime. Huh? I was fortunate enough it was definitely not a new car. In fact, it had over 200,000 miles on it. But I was fortunate enough to give a high school student a car one time. He took his senior pictures with it. It literally changed the direction of his life. Now that car is probably, it's a Ford, so it's probably well rusted out and dead. <laughs> but that feeling is still with me, and when its name is mentioned, I still smile somewhere inside. This is the difference between hollow living and holy living. Are you with me? Yeah. Hollow living and holy living. Amen. Do we really believe the words that it is more blessed to give than to receive? Yeah. Or is that just something we tell our children? See, when we give our lives away, the Lord rewards us with life. He does. When you fight to protect your life, to save it, to cultivate it, to culture it, you're actually cultivating death. That's just the reality. That's why the more you go to self-centered places and self-centered counselors, the more depressed you become. The more meds they give you, the worse off you end up. And by the way, if you're taking something that the side effects of are suicidal thoughts, you need to examine whether or not that's a wise thing to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you're taking antidepressants, church, I'm not against Tylenol. I'm not against medicine. But if it hasn't worked for you this year, let's try something else. Amen. Is that fair enough? Yes. Yes. Okay. Amen. Yeah. There's some amens in here for people who have gotten completely free and never gone back. Yeah. How about that? Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. We're not talking about the kind of burlap sack aestheticism that... Uh, put you as a monk in a cave and you do not care about your own life, of course you have to eat. Of course you have to uh, have health. You have to have those things. But these are not your primary concern. You do those things that are necessary, but our goal is towards the interest of others. This is not the exclusive domain of the rich or some philanthropist. This is the domain of every believer Period. And let me tell you why. 
What you did for yourself is going to get buried with yourself. Did you hear me? Yeah. Your accomplishments are going in the grave with you when they had to do with you. To the extent that you invest in other people, to the extent that your faith expresses itself in loving deeds towards other people, they go for thousands of generations. Especially if you can teach others to repeat it. It's amazing when these kind of things happen. Services like last week how it begins to show up and, and change your perspective. Yeah. What are we building the things that we're building for? I think the most important thing we could do is not have prettier carpet, not have a nicer building. The most important thing that we could possibly do is raise up people that are actually acting like Jesus. Yeah, Amen. there are a lot of beautiful churches with really ugly people. Yes. Amen. Yeah, anybody been to any of those? Yes. Yeah. I would rather be in an ugly church building with beautiful people. Yeah. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made Himself nothing. Come on, church. What situation are we ever in where we get the opportunity to literally make ourselves nothing? These are the opportunity where you feel the hairs on your neck rise. You feel tension. You feel ready for conflict because you're right. And we have the opportunity to not need to be anyone's equal. We have the opportunity to be nothing. And you know what that's like? Possessing everything. It's like being like Jesus. Can you go to any building that the Apostle Paul built? Can you go to his gravestone? Can you go meet his descendants? And see that he handed down wealth after generation after generation. What do you love him for? What he did for other people, the legacy that he left behind. Do you really think you'll be different? A hundred years after some of the celebrities that would come to your mind now are dead, will anybody know their name? Can anybody name a celebrity from 200 years ago? You might name a political figure. They weren't celebrities. People that are famous for being famous. Will anyone know their name? That's a good name. A good name is a valuable thing. A name in the Bible has to do with your character, your authority, your reputation. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made Himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Did you know that when you were baptized, this is what you were promising? You were promising that your flesh would be crucified with Christ. That you were dying with Him right then. That your life would never again be the same. You were going to walk away new as if granted a new life because the old nature was crucified. How can we say we've made good on our baptismal profession when we fight to be right now? When we care about our authority and want all our reputation and want all men to speak well of us? How could we do that? The King of Glory was killed as a common criminal. But we think if somebody cuts us off in traffic, we have the right to be defended. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name. There is a rule in the Bible that when you are humbled, God exalts. The rule works in reverse as well. When you exalt yourself, God will humble you. If not in this life, the next. This is why the Bible teaches many who are first will definitely be last. The power brokers of this age will not participate in the next age, but those who held the door and sweep the floors will rule the nations, the Bible teaches. But this all boils down to what you do today. Not tomorrow, not some other time. Today. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess 
that the Lord Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Watch this next part. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, hear this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not security and false doctrine. No. Fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. Why? To will and to act according to His good purpose. We cannot call ourselves His children and not do what He says. We simply cannot. Amen. The Bible says that He works in us to will and act according to His good purpose. There is one reason that He has filled you with the Holy Ghost, charismatic Christian, and it is not to speak in other tongues. It is to have the power to do what He is telling you to do. Amen. This is why Peter was hiding in the upper room the day before Pentecost, and right after Pentecost, he is laying the death of Jesus at the feet of a nation without fear. The Spirit of God was in him to move him to act and will according to his good purpose. Let me ask you, what happens if Peter said no that day? What if he said, you know, that doesn't fool me up inside, Lord. What I'd like to do is maybe sleep a little late today, sit around, play some video games, and look and see if anybody owes me money. Hmm. What if he'd done that? What if he'd said, you know, what I enjoy most is sunrises and mojitos. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what I'd like to do, Lord, today is just sit around and read, you know? All of these things are fine in and of themselves. When they're the defining characteristic of your life, rather than service outward, it is selfish. and something that God can't bless. One thing that the followers of Christ should never be marked with is self-centeredness. The gospel by definition starts inside of us and works its way outside of us. And friends, you don't know how many years you have. You don't know how many months you have. You know the phrase, make hay while the sun is shining? And you don't know whether you're in drought or monsoon season. We were given one barometer. What was the barometer in the scripture we were to look at? The nation of Israel. This was our barometer, like a fig tree. And when you see that its leaves are tender and it's, uh, it's ready to, to blossom, you know that time's at hand. Can you not look and see Israel surrounded by nations on every side? Yeah. Have you ever watched the UN on TV? What a godless band of dictators. What an incredible group of anti-Semites. If the only clock you have is Israel, how could you look at it and act like we have all the time in the world? For those of you that come here regularly, you know, I, I don't use preacher tricks. Come down here any moment because the rapture could occur. You could die on the way home, so you better get right to know. If that's your only motivation, I personally don't want to spend eternity with you. I really don't. I'm convinced if I don't like you right now, I probably am not going to like you for the next 10,000 years. I would rather share eternity with those who are the sons and daughters of God and are doing His will. Amen. These are not preacher tricks, but at some point, at some time, we really do have to lick our fingers, stick it in the air, and see which way the wind is blowing. You knew you had a week. What would your week look like? Isn't that a fair question? Yes. Yes. It's a question that gets asked all the time in churches and people walk out the same way they walked in. I, I want to ask you though, if you knew for sure at the end of this week somebody was going to cut your head off, what would you spend your time doing? Now compare that with what you did last week. Let me ask you, are we living up to the high calling that is on our lives? This is not to heap conviction upon you. I'm telling you that the church of the living God is better than it is living. I'm telling you that you don't have time to protect your health, wealth, and life. You don't. We have authority from the living God to pour it out. We have authority from the living God to be generous in every direction. And believe that when the Proverbs say, a generous man who refreshes others will himself be refreshed, that it's true. Turn with me to John 9. That was our preamble. <laughs> if you came to give Jesus your hour a week this week, 
I'm going to catch you up on the last few minutes. <laughs> As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Who sinned? Isn't that a fair question? Okay. What did this guy do to deserve that? I just came from India not all that long ago. This is preached from every corner in India. Don't help that guy on the street who's dying because he deserves to be there. And if you do help him, you're actually kind of working against the process of karma because karma is purifying him now so that he can have a better life in the next life. When you get right down to it, some of the monasteries throughout the Middle Ages didn't practice anything much different. You put a pebble in your shoe so you can suffer for Jesus, you're both stupid and innocent. And yet that's going on all over the Vatican right now. The Gospel declares one thing. The entire world is under the power of sin. So why did something bad happen to Darren? Is it because Darren sinned? Oh, it must have been Angie. Oh, I see CJ in the back. Angie's not here in this game. The truth is, is it's a collective problem that all, oh, oh, Daniel was here. <laughs> it's a collective problem that all mankind has. Uh, it, I, I personally am not big on the whole ozone eroding thing, Al Gore. I've never been friends. <laughs> but if there was a giant hole in the ozone layer, right, uh, Whose hairspray can could we attribute that to? <laughs> it's kind of all of our problem at that point, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Sin is the same way, friends. It entered through one man, and so did you. Every human being on the planet came to us through one man. The federal head of the human race was a sinner, and you came from his diseased stock. So who sinned, this man or his parents? Well, the reality is all of the above and yet none in the way that you're asking the question. You follow me? Sometimes things happen just because the world is in a decadent state. Self-indulgent and decaying. This man didn't sin before he was born. And did his parents sin to cause it? Well, apparently that is a reasonable question, but the answer here is absolutely not. It's just sin in the world. Listen to Jesus' answer. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Why did a bad thing happen to a seemingly good person? Isn't this a question we get all of the time? Why did this bad thing happen? Do you believe that this man's footsteps were ordered by God? Do you believe that God prepared good work in advance for him to do? See, all of those scriptures we only apply to health, wealth, and success. But what happens when God intended for somebody to be born with a deficiency that He might cure it and gain glory for Himself? This happened that God's glory might be displayed in His life. Anybody in here have a child that has been healed in the last 10 years? Look at all that. Wait, keep your hands up. Stick them up high. Saints, look around. Well, did, was it because they sinned? What if God just wanted to display His glory? Now raise your hand if you want to volunteer your child for that program. Do you see how the nature of a human being is in conflict with the nature of God? Somebody had to offer their child up, didn't they? So God set the example by offering His friend. Are you following me? Yes. I don't want my children to endure hardship. I don't. But the reality is hardship has shaped my life. I, I watch good parents provide for their children in ways that their parents never provided for them. It happens all the time. And you think you are doing a great thing. But what made you who you are? There is a refining process that happens as we endure trials. It refines us. It teaches us to trust in the Lord, to commit our way to the Lord. It teaches us to be pliable, to delight in His presence so that what comes out of us is really Him. 
Do this for me. Keep your finger here, but turn to Matthew 11, 5. Tell me when you're there. Don't give up on me. There. There. If you don't love me or like what we're doing, you can leave later, but right now I got you. Make it worse simple. Matthew 11, look at the fifth verse. Fourth verse. Go, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. When a man who was called by God began to doubt who Jesus was, Jesus was able to point to the oppression that he alleviated as doing God's work. But who wants to sign up to be oppressed? The Bible says, blessed are the poor. Do you know anybody that's fighting to be poor? Well, let's ask the question another way, too. Do you know anybody fighting to be rich? It's almost like we would like to just live the American dream and try to cram Jesus into it in an acceptable container. Yep. Which <coughs> apostle didn't walk away from everything he ever had to follow Jesus? Now let me ask you a more pertinent question. What did you walk away from? And how many times? I gotta tell you, I gave up everything I had to follow Jesus. But along the way, I collected some things that competed with it. And from time to time, he wants them. Amen. Yeah, you know who, who who you hear laughing and you you hear a little agreement inside and you see eyes begin to flicker? Those who've experienced that. Amen. But to most people, salvation is a decision they made at an altar as a child. And maybe somebody threw some water at their head or dumped them underwater. And they that's salvation. Friends, that's not salvation. It never has been, never will be. Salvation is a changed life, walking in the newness of life. Salvation is living as led by God's Spirit. It costing you everything, every day. There is no other kind. There is no other kind of salvation. Where would Jesus get lepers? Where would He get uh, poor people? Where would He get if we all had our own way? Bad things happen to people so that God's power might be displayed in their lives. Which begs a different question. Is it really bad? Maybe this is why the Bible says consider it pure joy. Maybe that would show a trust or confidence and security in the Lord. Maybe that would make you pliable in His presence and get you to roll in His direction. How about John 11? Turn with me to John 11. Keep your finger in John 9. In John 11, how about this one? When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. I don't know how many of you came from the Word of Faith era. I'm not picking on that. Some of the leaders were fantastic, but I do want you to hear this. To say that God cannot be glorified through a sickness is to deny the Word. It is to deny the Word. Do you see it? Right here in John 11, 4... God is being glorified through a sickness that ends in death. You know why? Because He's able to do something about it. You know, the church that runs around the healing, glorious, victorious church, right? That never experiences hardship is just as crazy as those that never experience healing. You know why? The reality is sometimes God is glorified through your Son. Amen. He is. Amen. Not only are you refined, not only does it eliminate the superfluous in your life and focus you on what's important, others get to see whether or not your faith is genuine and real. And they learn from it. So if we work to eliminate all suffering, all deficit, all difficulty in the life of every believer, what do you have beside a rich, dumb, fat, bless me group? <laughs> We could just go join a book club with Oprah Winfrey and be happy, right? <laughs> but there really is not a lot of difference in the average American gospel and Dr. Fiddle, is there? 
The real gospel is a gut-wrenchingly difficult thing. God brings difficulty into your life for one reason, for He wants to display His glory through it. And if we never find the end of you, then we never find the beginning of Him. So in this light, then, is He punishing you? Are you being beaten up? No. Is He... Is he why would God beat His bride? You know, all of those ridiculous church sayings? No, He's being glorified as you're being refined. It's showing the sincerity of your faith. Amen. In Acts 4.21, don't turn there. I rarely lie when I'm preaching. In Acts 4.21, Peter and John have just received a beating because they have healed a man. And it says that all of the people began praising God for what they had seen. Well, we read that and we're excited because the man was healed. But what about the day before he was healed? What about the day before the end of the struggle? Are you one of those that has to read the last chapter of the book to know whether the book is worth it? Do you want to know how? I, one thing I loved about my daddy, he, he would sit next to me during a movie and ask me what was going to happen in every scene. You know? Hey, 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 hey. You know, he just couldn't, couldn't wait, wait to the end. I can relate to that. But I want to tell you, sometimes 2,000 years after the cross, we know the end so many times that we forget about the previous chapters that are so difficult. People of God have been thrown in well, sold in two, crucified, tarred and feathered, beheaded. People of God have always had to give up everything. There is no other kind. This is how you separate a sheep from a goat. How about this then? Pick up with me in verse 4 of chapter 9. As long as it is day, we must do the work of Him who sent me. Night is coming when no man can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. One of the reasons we like shows like Knight Rider... Nobody likes that show anymore. One of the reasons back in the day we liked shows like Knight Rider or Dukes of Hazard, or, I don't know, name a sitcom, anything that, that had a rescuing figure in it, is the problem was presented, the hero was presented, and it always resolved in an hour. And how mad were you? How mad were you those times that you got right to the end and it didn't resolve and they said... To be continued. And you had to wait a whole week. How old kid dog for you? You can be honest. Oh, yeah. Come on. I hated it. And a season cliffhanger every year, I promise not to watch the show again. <laughs> we don't like things that don't resolve quickly. We're impatient people. But if trust, grounded obedience, or faith is going to be cultivated in us, everything can't resolve quickly, can it? Sometimes you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have to grind and hurt just a little bit. Get some skin in the game. And learn to find satisfaction in what you do for other people, not what's being Amen. done. For you. Amen. Amen. This is not for a few people who just like to give to charities. I mean that that you you know what? There's no more powerful entity on the on the face of the of the world. Than the local church, if the Christians are real. There's not. This is where your healing should come from. This is where your teaching should come from. This is where you create and live in the life that God has for you. The local church. The reason that many are looking outside the local church is we've never learned to actually be the church. We go to it as a building. But when you start asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? today. Things begin to change. Jesus said night is coming when no man can work. Night is coming. He said while it's day, we must do the work of Him who sent me. Amen. Guys, there is a finite time period. Ecclesiastes, you can write this one down, 9, 7 through 10 teaches us that every man has an appointment with the grave. Every single one. It is absolutely unavoidable. So he comes to one conclusion. Whatever work God has given you to do, work hard at it. Amen. Amen. Now you could take a real secularist point of view to that and say, okay, well God called me to be a mortgage broker, so I'm going to sell mortgages with as many points on them as I can get. It's funny how we can always take something and turn it into a selfish thing. Why do you work hard at the jobs you have? 
times where we're full of things like, well, to provide for my family. Well, that's a given, friends. That's the basic of Christianity. But what about the other 90% of the world that lives on $3 a day or less? See, when we start our capitalist mentality, and I am a capitalist, a big one, free market guy. But our mentality that we have been raised in is I work hard for what I have and so I deserve it. When what Christ says is you don't have anything that I didn't give you. You have no abilities that I didn't give you. And don't look at yourself when things are going well, Deuteronomy 8 says, and say, I have all of this by the strength of my own arm. Do not do that. So how do you guard against those things? You have to live a life that is outward focused. That needs to be something that is so habitual that it is an everyday thing. That's when the church becomes the church. Everybody who wants to be a New Testament church, have you ever read how the New Testament believers live? Who do you know that has sold all of their possessions to provide for the poor? Who do you know that took their estates and laid them at the, the feet of the apostles and had to show up in a bread line with other believers? That's how the early church lived. They had all things in common. I'm not advocating communism here. Okay? I'm not advocating anything that has to do with governmental structure or authority. What I'm speaking of is a selflessness, a sacrificing, powerful spirit that is actually life. And I'm telling you, we only have so many years to do this. And yet what you hear most of the time if you're a pastor is when I get to such and such place, then I will be obedient. Can I just tell you, I've done a lot of weddings, a lot of funerals, a lot of baby dedications. Nobody ever gets to that place, and when they do, they move the bar. There's always an excuse not to do today what God has told you to do. Always. Jesus had an urgency about him. He said, there are so many hours of light in which a man can work. Night is coming in which no man can work. He also said this in John 11. He said it in John 12. In John 4, 34 and 35, he said, open your eyes. The harvest is all around you. In the 34th verse, which came just before that, he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and complete his task. There was a sense of urgency about Jesus because he only had so much time to complete his task. What was his task? Save the world. The whole world. He got it done in three and a half years of public ministry. Who in here has been born again longer than three and a half years? Raise your hand. Born again longer than three and a half years. How about that? How are we doing when compared with our people? Maybe we are not taking up his attitude seriously enough. If we had to have you raise hands for seeing somebody born again, because you've been sharing your life with them. How many hands would go up if it was in the last year? How many of us would have to go back to five years to answer that question? Do you believe the time is short? Do you believe the harvest is around us? Do you believe God is an honoring, selfish living? Well, what would it take to wake us up? See, we are so convinced that our churches, that our life is so superior to the rest of the world. But you know what the rest of the world understands that Americans don't? Sacrifice. When we give, we give out of our plenty. You know? Recently, somebody told me they didn't have $75 for a very worthwhile project. $75 for something that would change a child's life. 75 bucks. But the family drives two cars. Got one for each adult. Got a pedal television. Got TVs. Don't think anybody's going hungry. Do we really not have $75? We just don't think it's important. We think it's important enough for somebody else to sacrifice for, but not us. Guys, how long do you think we can make like that? Let's go back to that question about the last week you have on the planet. If it was your last week, where would you make that investment? 
Well, it might be. Who knows? It might be. Proverbs 10.5 says a wise son works during the harvest, but a disgraceful son sleeps during the harvest. You know what determines whether or not God calls you wise or disgraceful? What you do. What you do. Are you earning salvation? Of course not. That's a stupid question. It couldn't be earned. It has everything to do with do you believe these things enough to do something or not? So back to that question about today. What is he telling you to do today? Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home See, friends, do you believe this guy got healed? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Where did he get healed? At a pool called Sent. If you are healed or saved, and in the Bible there is no difference between the two, you are also sent. It is not possible to be saved without being sent, and it is not possible to be, to be truly sent without being saved. The two go hand in hand. To be saved is to be sent to the lost to the dying, to the oppressed, to the hurt. Because your life is no longer about you. It's about Him and them. If you are saved, you are sent. Does anybody remember a message called Messianic Miracles? Good. I'll tell you about this quickly. Then. In Jesus' day, there were other rabbis that did miracles. Yeah. Do you remember Jesus when, when casting out the devil uh, was accused of, of doing it by the power of Beelzebub? Yes. That would be Matthew 12. And he said, well, if I do it like this, how do your disciples do it? Because they were doing it. Uh, a guy named Hanina Mendoza was a healer in the century before Jesus. Another one named Honey the circle drawer uh, would pray. He would draw a circle on the ground. He'd stand in and pray until there was rain. The religious community didn't like it. But the problem is, it always worked. So they couldn't criticize him. There have been miracle workers. You remember uh, in, in the Older Testament, Elijah's bones touched someone. And, and, and a dead body came out of the grave. There have been miracles a long time before Jesus. Because of this, an attitude developed in the first century. The attitude was... When Messiah comes, He will do the miracles that we don't see. In other words, the people of God were used to seeing the work of God, but there were some things they didn't see. And when they thought about those things, they said, when Messiah comes, we will see those things. First on the list was nowhere in Israel's history had an Israeli been cured of leprosy since the Mosaic Law was given. Now Miriam had had leprosy and God cured her when Moses prayed, but it was before the law. Naaman was cured of leprosy, but he was not an Israelite. God gave them in Leviticus 13 and Leviticus 14 rules for healing a leper. And it involved going to the priesthood, having him inspect you to see if you really had leprosy, and praying for you, sequestering you, and then coming back to see if you were healed. The special sacrifice that involved a dead bird, a live bird, and some blood and scarlet thread. Now that may all seem ridiculous to you, but if for 1,600 years you had been reading that chapter, if you had it memorized, but in 1,600 years there was never a person that it had been done for, then you might go, well, maybe when Messiah comes, he'll do that. Second in the list of Messianic miracles, there was a formula for casting out devils. I don't personally agree with this, but it was in rabbinic literature. And the first thing that you did when casting out a devil in the first century was ask its name. Jesus even followed that formula a couple times. What is your name? The demon replied to him, Legion, for we are many. What an Israeli had never seen was somebody cast out a demon that was causing mutinous. Do you see the inherent problem here? How do we ask its name if it doesn't speak? So 
the myth or lore or however you would like to think about it, folk legend grew that when Messiah comes, he will heal lepers and he will cast out the dumb demons. Not that they're smart ones, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Nobody had ever seen blind eyes. If you read further in this chapter, opened if the man was born blind. So again, the idea grew when Messiah comes. He'll be able to do that. They had seen eyes open, but never somebody who was born without eyeballs. Jesus made this man eyes. You think he was led by the Spirit? He made eyes. The fourth messianic miracle was people had been raised from the dead in the Older Testament and in the Newer Testament. But nobody had ever been dead for four days and come back. What do you think about this thing? In Mark 2, in Luke 5, and I know you guys have these things memorized. When I say this, they're coming right to you right now. The first time you ever see religious leaders showing up at Jesus' meetings, he's just healed a leper. And their format was to stand and listen, investigate. Not by asking, just observing. The problem is every time they showed up, Jesus could read their thoughts and did. Once they determined that a leper had actually been healed, then they begin to question him about healing. And it grows in intensity. Do you remember in John 9? We haven't read this yet. They question the man. They try to determine whether or not it was real. They determine he's a sinner steeped in sin from birth, and they reject it. We get all the way to the place where Lazarus dies. And there's a little meeting with Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. And they come to the conclusion in the last part of John 11, there's nothing left to do but kill Jesus because he's completed four very specific miracles that only a Messiah could do. And this was not a Messiah they wanted because he was based on self-sacrifice, giving life away. What they wanted was a Messiah who came in and did for them everything they wanted him to do. Are we really so different? Think about those four miracles for a moment. But if Jesus said, you know, it's getting late. Maybe another day. And he walked on. His steps were ordered by the Lord to the point that he said, I only do what I see my Father do. I only say what I hear him say. When he healed this man, it was ordered that he healed this man. And it proved to a nation that he was exactly who God said he was. What happens if you walk in obedience to the Spirit, doing what he has told you to do in the moment he tells you to do? It begins to glorify God. It will always be based on your sacrifice. It's why it requires a cutting away of your heart, a circumcision of your heart. It would always be based on diminishing you in some way. This is why the, the world of the church doesn't do it. But if you do, in four miracles, Jesus proved to an entire nation and the leadership that he was exactly who he said he was. To the point that he said one time in the book of John, if you don't believe me, believe the evidence of the miracles themselves. I had no response for it. Because nobody could deny it. Friends, we believe that witnessing is sharing a certain order of scriptures with people. We believe it's a format with a neat little cute prayer at the end. Witnessing is what you do every day that displays the attributes of Christ. In your Amen. When the church rises to meet this, we won't have to invite people to church anymore. They'll say, what's going on in your life? I want some of it. Amen. Then the scripture that Peter says, be prepared to give everyone an answer who asks you about your life will be true. This is what our king is moving us towards. A walk that silences the mouths of those who would criticize you because they have nothing bad to say about you. I might not like somebody's doctrine, but if they're feeding orphans with me, they're protecting the lives of the unborn with me. 
all of a sudden we become close friends. Amen. Church, I want to tell you God has ordained work for you to do. Not Matthew, not me, not Steve, not Charlie. You. He wants it done by you. So your question really needs to be, Lord, what do you want for me today? And then be satisfied with that for that day. And every day, like a child who wants new bread, like somebody hungering for something new, fresh bread from heaven, you can stand up and say, Lord, today give us our daily bread. You are asking for the food that is doing his will and completing his task. And it will sustain you. You have to spend time with loved ones in hospitals. You have to meet with relatives who want to beat you up. <laughs> I got to do a little of all of that. It'll be like a meal that was fully satisfying because you know it was the Lord's task for you that day. And if nobody else understands it, you can walk away and smile because you didn't shy away from it. You did what he asked you to do. You may have done all kinds of things he didn't ask you to do. I want to tell you, I do that all the time. Okay. That's called sin. But I also am trying to do what he did tell me to do. Amen. This is the last point I want to make with you. The church is obsessed with sin that is, don't do this, don't do that. And it's a life of restriction. The first words God ever spoke to a man are, you are free to eat from any tree. The restriction is only there when we do wrong. Our lives cannot be defined by the things that we don't do. Your life must be defined by what you actually do. The work that you perform in this man. This is the difference between a sheep and a goat, period. It's not what you believed, it's what you did or did not do. And I pray that you all be found sheep. Stand up and let's pray.